Good morning, everybody. We are live here from the birdhouse after a bit of a break. We've been doing some in-person things like bird walks, and we've had a couple of those uh, lately. So we haven't had a live broadcast in, in over a week. So we are back, and today we're talking about birdhouses and nesting because it's getting to be about that time that birds are starting to look for places to nest and start even the nest building process. So as always, we love to know who's on. You can say hi in the comments. If you have any questions, you can throw those in there too. And if you have any sightings, we love to know what kind of things you're seeing. Right now is a really fun time of the year because all kinds of different things are starting to flow in. We're starting to get some early migrants. So um, we love to know what kind of things you're seeing. You can put those right in the comments as well. So we will get started here. As far as birdhouses and nesting goes, not all birds will use birdhouses. So that's one thing to keep in mind. If you're trying to attract different birds to your yard, they don't all come to a house. So they don't all come to a house. Certain birds don't all come to feeders. Uh, they'll all come to some kind of a water feature, but not all of them will use a house. So some of our more common species are not cavity nesters, which means they won't go in the house. Like cardinals are a good example. They will nest in trees and in shrubs. Blue jays are another example of a bird that doesn't use a house. Goldfinches, which nest very late in the season, not until what about July or so. They don't use houses either. And our Baltimore Orioles, once they start coming back, we've got about a month to go until we start seeing some Baltimore Orioles. They don't nest in houses, but they weave pretty elaborate nests that will hang from a branch of a tree. And hummingbirds are another example of some birds that do not use houses. Uh, but we'll talk about a whole bunch of them that do today. And another bird of note, which is pretty interesting and has interesting nesting behavior is the brown-headed cowbird. And brown-headed cowbirds are what are called nest parasites. And they lay their eggs in the nests of other birds, whether they be in a house or, you know, in a tree or shrub. And here's an example of what a brown-headed cowbird's nest uh, or egg looks like. Um, the brown-headed cowbird egg is this big egg here surrounded by the smaller blue eggs. And the female will lay her egg in the nest of a different species. And that species will raise the brown-headed cowbird like their own. And the brown-headed cowbirds tend to grow very quickly. They're pretty large, so they can outcompete some of the native species. Or, well, they're all native, but some of the, uh, the other species like warblers and things like that. So brown-headed cowbirds, people have mixed feelings about, but they are a native bird that we do have around here and they are becoming um, increasingly more common. So uh, you might even see them at your bird feeders too in mixed flocks of red-winged blackbirds and grackles and things. Keep an eye out for brown-headed cowbirds because they'll sometimes join the mix of um, blackbirds at your feeders. So as far as birdhouses go, when you're putting up a birdhouse, they most, most birds do like a house that is stable and secure so it doesn't move around a lot it doesn't swing around in the wind so the best thing you can do is put it on a pole that doesn't move um you can put them on the side of trees or the side of houses the only thing with that is it can leave them a little bit more susceptible to predators that can easily climb up the tree like a squirrel or a raccoon um so it can leave them more susceptible, but some, some birds have no issues nesting in boxes on the side of trees, like woodpeckers, for example, and screech owls. They're naturally nesting in cavities that are going to be in trees. So they're, they're more of a, of a species. You can put a house on a side of a tree or side of a house. Um, but for things like bluebirds and chickadees, I would suggest putting them on a pole that you could put a baffle on if you want to, to keep those predators from climbing up um, the pole and raiding the nest because they will sometimes grab the eggs out of the house. They'll sometimes grab the nestlings themselves. So that can be an issue. Um, there's other things you can get to, uh, like little tunnels that go on the outside of the house um, that can keep predators from reaching in and, and grabbing the young. So there's different things you can do to keep the predators out as well. Um, there are some types of birds though that don't mind houses that swing around like this. Uh, wrens and chickadees 
are good examples of, of birds that don't mind a house that moves around a bit in the wind. So one of the simplest ways to start attracting birds to nest in your yard is by putting up a rent house or a chickadee house um, that just hangs from a tree or um, you can hang it from a pole. So there's different types of houses. For the most part though, birds are going to prefer something that is stable and secure and doesn't move around. So some of our cavity nesting species that we have here are going to be bluebirds and bluebirds are one of our earliest nesting species. They start nesting right around now, sometimes as early as March. Um, now we are into April and we're getting some reports of bluebirds starting to build nests, which I'll show you as we as we go on, which is pretty exciting. Uh, but bluebirds like a wide open area. So if you've never seen them before, that's not totally uncommon. They do like meadows and fields. Uh, farm fields are a good example of places you can go to see the bluebirds. And this is what their nests look like. These are a couple nest boxes I have. And um, these are some bluebird nests from previous years. They will weave them with a whole bunch of uh, grasses. So they use a lot of tall grasses in their nest building. And you can see what their eggs look like too. They've got blue eggs just like a robin does. They're in that same family as the um, as the robin. They're in the thrush family and they've got those blue eggs just like a robin does. So this is an example of a bluebird nest. Now if you've got bluebird boxes out in a meadow or field, you might find that you get not only bluebirds, but you get tree swallows. Um, these, these are tree swallows here. They're really pretty iridescent blue with a bright white breast, and they will make a nest using grasses, but then also a lot of feathers. So here's a couple other nest boxes I have, and uh, tree swallows went right inside, and you can see that they used a whole bunch of feathers in their nest building. So if you open up that nest box and you see a whole bunch of feathers in there, it's probably a tree swallow. One issue that people have a lot of the time if they put out a bluebird house, the bluebird house the hole in it is an inch and a half in diameter, and that is the size that the bluebirds need in order to fit inside. However, that also opens it up to house sparrows, and you've probably seen house sparrows at your feeders, uh, but they are also cavity nesting species, so they will go in bluebird houses too if they are around. Um, house sparrows have more of a messy kind of nest, and this is what their eggs look like. They're kind of brown and speckly, and they'll use grasses, they'll use um, fur, so sometimes they'll use pieces of plastic. Um, so they'll use all kinds of different materials to build their nests and their nests are usually pretty messy, but this is the house sparrow. And there's different things you can do to help keep house sparrows out. Um, they aren't protected either, so uh, meaning they're an introduced species. So you could, uh, if you want to, you can remove the nest, if they start building a nest somewhere you don't want them to, you can remove that nest, you can remove the eggs, you can remove the birds themselves if you decide to. Another species that is not protected is going to be the European starling, and they are also a cavity nesting species. So if you have either of them, either those or the house sparrows nesting in a place you don't want them to, you can remove any of that nest and nesting material or birds themselves. And then here's a picture of a European starling nest. And European starlings, they do need a bigger nesting box than a bluebird house. Um, but the um, if you have like a woodpecker house out or if you have a screech owl house or a kestrel box out, that's what you might get European starlings in. So something that's a bigger nesting cavity than say a bluebird house. So bluebird houses are still too small for the starlings to squeak into. So it's really gonna be those bigger nesting boxes that you might put out that will attract the starlings. But um, they have a really, really big nest with a lot of grasses in it. They also have blue eggs. <clears throat> Um, wrens are another cavity nester and wrens are the type of bird that don't mind a house that swings around a lot in the wind. We get all kinds of interesting reports of places that wrens nest. Um, and I should actually add some of those pictures here because we get some fun pictures sent in. Um, 
we have had people who've had wrens nesting in the pockets of clothes that have been left out on clotheslines. So shirt pockets, pants pockets. Um, they'll nest in people's mailboxes. They nest in their garages all the time. Uh, we had a report somebody left their shoes outside overnight. And in the morning, a wren had started building a nest in the shoes. So wrens are pretty funny because they will build a nest in all kinds of different things and in different spaces. Um, so there's a couple different species that we have here. There's the Carolina wren and they are singing their little hearts out right now. So they are looking for nesting sites. And then there's house wrens. These are gonna be the two most common that you'd get in houses here. And they build nests with a lot of sticks. And so even if you have a big, birdhouse they will fill it up completely with sticks it's pretty amazing um, if you've ever opened up one of your houses and you find that there's just a small layer of sticks in there that's probably from a wren who started the nest building process um, which the males do so the males will start building the nest and then they'll sing their little hearts out to attract females and they'll bring females to different nesting sites and she decides which site she likes the best and then continues on that nest building process. So if you've ever seen that there's a little bit of nesting activity where you've got some sticks in a house but no nest was ever fully formed, that was probably going to be from a wren that started the process but decided to nest ultimately somewhere else. Another cavity nester that we have here are chickadees and both wrens and chickadees have nesting boxes with small holes on them. So they only need an entrance hole of an inch or with chickadees, it's an inch and eighth and an eighth in size. So they can squeak inside some of these small houses and those small houses are too small for a house sparrow to fit into. So if you've got real house sparrow issue and you don't wanna attract more of them, but you wanna put out some bird houses, you can put out wren and chickadee houses and those house sparrows won't be able to fit inside. So that's one way you can attract some of the native nesters and not the house sparrows. If you have a house already and you, um, in the hole, say the hole is big enough to have house sparrows in it and you want to make it smaller. We do have metal plates you can put on the outside of that nest box to make the hole smaller. So the cavity size won't be, or the cavity won't be um, the right size for the birds anymore. Um, here's a picture that was sent in of a, of a chickadee in a wren house. So they do use those houses that will, um, that kind of hang and will swing in the wind. And here's a picture of their nest. They use a lot of moss in their nest building. So if you open up your birdhouse and you see there's something that is being made with a lot of moss, that's gonna be from the chickadee. Some other cavity nesters that we have here are tufted titmouse. They're in the same family as chickadees actually, and they will nest in cavities. Um, so that we do have tiff titmouse houses and they will uh, all these birds will also nest in natural tree cavities as well so when you're out uh, or if you if, when you're out hiking or if you've got trees in your backyard with natural cavities in them uh, keep an eye out because you might see any of these going in there um, nut hatches are another cavity nester so we also have houses for them and they will nest in trees, both the white-breasted nuthatch and the red-breasted nuthatch. So we've got those two species here. And this is one that we've talked about here and there, the brown creeper. So with nuthatches, um, you usually see them crawling down the sides of trees and brown creepers will, will climb up the side of trees and they blend in really, really well. If you look at the feathers on that bird, they blend in very, very well with the bark of trees. So they can be hard to see actually, but if you see a little brown bird that's moving up the side of a tree, that's gonna be your brown creeper. And they are, again, a cavity nester. All of our woodpeckers will nest in cavities and we have several of them here. There's of course the downy woodpecker, there's the hairy woodpecker, the red-bellied woodpecker, pileated woodpecker. So all of these are pretty common backyard birds that you might get nesting in your trees. They will excavate their own cavities. Um, they'll also reuse uh, other, other cavities as well, but they will make their own a lot of the time. But you can get boxes for woodpeckers as well. Woodpeckers don't make a nest 
like songbirds do. They will just excavate their cavity and just lay their eggs right inside so they don't have a nice padded nest. Um, and the European starlings are, uh, are pretty competitive as far as nesting sites go with the woodpeckers. The woodpeckers will excavate the cavities and then sometimes the starlings will take them over. Uh, great crested flycatcher. This is another cavity nester that we have here. Um, there are boxes for great crested flycatcher, but this isn't going to be your most common backyard bird, although we do get reports that people do get them in their backyard. They eat a lot of insects and they tend to be in more wooded areas. So this would be a bird you'd most likely to see nesting in the woods somewhere when we do our walks out at Tinker Nature Park in the in the spring as we get you know, more into the spring, we usually see some great crested flycatcher out there. It's a really good place to see them. Uh, and they are cavity nesters and they will use with their nest building, they tend to always have some kind of a snake skin inside. So um, just an interesting fact there about the great crested flycatcher. And then some larger birds and birds of prey are also cavity nesters, screech owls being a good example of that. And people have had pretty good luck actually with attracting screech owls to nesting boxes. Now they're, they're larger nesting boxes, so they have an entrance hole of three inches. So they are quite large. They're going to be bigger than woodpecker houses, uh, but screech owls will go inside of those. And so will American kestrels. So the, the specs are just about the same with screech owl houses and with American kestrel, which is a, a small falcon that we have here, but both of them are cavity nesters. And then some waterfowl are known to nest in cavities. Wood duck are a really good example. If you go out to a swampy area or any kind of park that has a pond, you might see those big uh, nesting boxes that are out by the water. Those are for wood duck. So wood duck will nest in those. Sometimes people even get um, screech owls going into those boxes, which is pretty fun. Um, but yeah, the wood duck is another cavity nester that you're most likely not going to get in your backyard unless you have some kind of um, a pond. And this is one of the young leaving the house there. Um, and then a couple other birds or a couple other waterfowl that will nest in houses are the hooded merganser and the bufflehead, a couple other cavity nesters that we do have in the area. So there are a lot of different types of birdhouses that have different size uh, specs as far as the cavity goes. So the, the sizes of the house, them, the houses themselves are, are different sizes. The entrance holes, what's really going to dictate what comes, what, what's able to come and go from the house. The smaller the hole gets, the more uh, limited it is as far as species that can use it. There's also what are called nesting platforms. And so these aren't nesting boxes per se, because they do have open sides, they have open fronts, uh, but there are birds that will use these like robins for example so if you've got a robin that is nesting in a place that you don't want or every year will nest somewhere you don't really want them to say on a light fixture or you know we, we get all kinds of different reports of places robins are nesting where people don't really want them you can encourage them to nest on a platform like this if you put it kind of close to the area where you usually get them so um, these are sometimes called nesting platforms or robin roosts. Um, other birds that might use them are morning doves. And morning doves are known to build very, very sloppy nests um, that fall apart quite easily. So um, having a nesting platform like this can be helpful because it, it kind of keeps the nest intact. So robins absolutely will use these morning doves. Um, you might get birds like barn swallows using those, or you can put up we have these little um, cups basically that are on a board and you can attach those to the side of, you know, if you've got barn swallows in a gazebo or something like that, um, they will nest in these little cups. So barn swallows will make their own or you can put out these little nesting cups here to try to attract them. And here's some young barn swallows. This is just a cute picture here of a whole bunch of young coming out of the nest and another type of bird that will nest in a house. It's going to be the purple martin. And purple martins can be kind of difficult to attract depending on where you are. They tend to like it by the water. So if you're by a big open pond or um, by a lake, your chances of getting purple martins are, 
or better. So they do like a wide open area. If you've got a lot of trees around, you're not going to really get the purple martins, uh, but they nest all together. So they have houses that have multiple chambers and nesting cavities, usually anywhere from eight to 24 is pretty common as far as the purple martin houses go with the number of uh, chambers it has for the birds to nest in. They'll also nest in gourds too. So you might see a combination of houses and gourds. One really good place to go fairly locally to see purple martins are um, is at Montezuma at the nature center out there. Uh, they've got martin houses and every year they come back. So there's some more martins here on a house and then there's also some gourds. So they'll nest in either one of those. And then you can always put out nesting material too, even to attract those birds that don't nest in cavities. And as far as nesting material goes, um, one of the most common things we sell are these little nesting balls. And there's a picture of a goldfinch there on the left using it. The goldfinches love it. It's all natural cotton and you just hang it up. It comes with a little string and the birds will pull the cotton out of here and they'll use it to either build a nest or to line the interior of a nest. Um, over the past week, I've been seeing sparrows are starting to grab some of this nesting material. So they're starting to look for things and other birds will start grabbing the nesting material. One question we get a lot is if, uh, is if it's okay to use dryer lint for nesting material. And you really shouldn't because it's not known if the detergents can harm the birds in any way. So um, you might want to stay away from dryer lint, but you can use natural cotton like this. You can also use pet fur. If you have a fluffy pet at home and you're, you're brushing them, um, you can save that fur and the birds will use that for nesting material as well. So you can, you know, stuff, if you've got a nesting ball, once it's gone, it's it's just in a little net kind of a mesh bag. You could reuse that with pet fur or people will put pet fur in suet cages. That's another way you can provide the birds with some nesting material. And this is a picture here of a tufted titmouse that's actually just grabbing the fur right off of some kind of an animal. I can't tell if it's a, a dog or an opossum or, or what that is. Uh, but tufted titmice are well known for doing that. They will um, land right on an animal, an animal and pull the fur right out uh, of the of the animal. So they use a lot of pet fur in their nest building. And then we have these things that are called roosting pockets. So these aren't necessarily going to be a thing a bird will nest in, although I just recently had a customer say that they did have a bird that, um, I believe it was a wren, that nested in one, in one of these. Um, usually they're too small of a cavity for the birds to nest in, but you never know. These are more to keep birds out of the the rain and the snow and the wind, so these can keep them sheltered from the elements, but um, not necessarily something you want to put out if you're trying to attract birds to nest, but these are really common in the winter, especially when we get, you know, really bad snowstorms and that kind of a thing. Birds will go inside there just to seek some kind of a shelter. So that is what I have prepared for you guys as far as nesting goes. If you have questions, you can put those in the comments, or if you have any sightings you want to report, go ahead and throw those in the comments. And we've had some pretty neat photos sent in to us over the past week or so that I thought I would share. The first being these pictures that were sent in by Mark over at Owl Woods. So last Saturday, I was uh, leading a walk at Owl Woods with Rochester Birding Association, and it was not a very nice day. It was very cold and very windy and very rainy. So unfortunately, we did not see a single Sawat Owl, which is what we were looking for, but they are there. So they are migrating through the area right now. And although I had a bad day out there last Saturday, a lot of people are still reporting them um, over this past week. So Sawat Owl, they're definitely in the area out of Owl Woods in the Braddock Bay area, and they migrate at night. And then during the day, they just hunker down there, and then they will continue that migration process over the next evening, usually. Um, so you want to make sure that you give them their space. If you do see the saw wet owls, uh, you want to make sure to stay far enough away that you don't disturb them, that you let them get their sleep because they do need to continue on with that migration 
process. So this was a picture of a northern sawwood owl, which is actually, again, another cavity nester. Although we don't get them nesting here, they do nest further up north um, in, house, in screech owl houses. So screech owl sized houses are perfect for the northern sawwood owl. And um, this picture was sent in just recently by Mark, who had good luck out there at Owl Woods because he also sent in this picture of a long-eared owl, which are harder to spot there. They don't come in in the same numbers as the northern sawwood owls, uh, but he got this nice picture here of a long-eared owl also. So those are the two species that people are looking for most commonly out at Owl Woods right now, although there's sometimes barred owls out there, um, great horned owls. But right now, um, really the Sawwet owl are going to be the most numerous, and then there are scattered reports of long-eared owl out there as well. So fun stuff there. And then we just got these photos sent in. So this is some uh, signs that birds are starting to nest. And the, this is, uh, I think it was just sent in this morning by Bob, who says, I noticed a pair of bluebirds checking out the birdhouse four days ago, but no nesting materials. Yesterday, however, the female started bringing nesting materials. I checked this morning and voila. So the nesting process has begun. It's April 1st and I guess they are they are ready. And here's a picture there of a female who's got some nesting material in her bill. So uh, Bob has reported the bluebirds are starting to nest. So it is happening. So very good timing, uh, especially considering uh, the topic today. And speaking of bluebirds, this photo was sent in by Stacy, who says, I've been trying to attract bluebirds for years with no luck so far, but I was excited to see this female I think, and yes, it does look like a female, on 328. Hope she sticks around. Also saw this pair of mockingbirds on 329. So that this is a pretty cool picture here. It's rare to see uh, two mockingbirds at your feeders at the same time around here, although um, people do get mockingbirds here and there coming to their bird feeders. So this is a really cool photo of uh, two mockingbirds. There's one up top and one on the suet here, and then there's also a house sparrow in the mix there as well. So Really neat photos there sent in by Stacy, And then Mark had some more photos that he sent in of some different birds out and about, um, including this juvenile bald eagle that was being chased by some gulls. Song sparrow. So on Tuesday, we did a walk at Tinker Nature Park here with the bird house, um, which was a pretty okay day. It was a little rainy, a little drizzly, but we had some pretty good luck with blue uh, bluebirds. We saw we saw a whole bunch of different woodpeckers. We saw a pair of wood ducks, and we heard some song sparrow. The song sparrows were starting to sing as well. So uh, this photo was sent in by Mark of a song sparrow here. So keep your ears open for the song sparrows because they are starting to sing. A bunch of the birds are starting to sing early in the mornings. You've probably heard them. Uh, if you have your windows open or even if you don't have your windows open, um, they've been quite, quite chatty in the mornings and they will start pretty early as well. Um, speaking of wood duck, this could be the same one we even saw on Tuesday because this is also at Tinker Nature Park. And this is what is called a female ruddy duck. And uh, this is another photo that was sent in by Mark. The male ruddy ducks are the species that have that blue bill. Um, so neat photo here of a female ruddy duck. And then hooded mergansers, which are another one of our cavity nesting species we have here. Here is a pair of hooded mergansers, some different photos that were sent in again by Mark of the male and female. And it looks like the male is putting on quite a display here, probably trying to attract a mate. So some really fun photos that you guys sent in. And the last one here we have is a pileated woodpecker. And it looks like this was also at Tinker Nature Park. Mark sent this in, the pileated woodpecker at the suet feeder. And then also, speaking of nesting activity, um, he says a pair of pileated woodpecker possibly working on a nest at Tinker Nature Park. So looks like they were possibly going in and out of a cavity there. So now is the time that the birds are definitely starting to look. So if you haven't put your birdhouses up, now is definitely the time. If you've got your birdhouses up uh, and you never cleaned them out from last year, definitely clean out those nests, clean out any debris that's in there. 
now is the time to do that. And when you're picking out a birdhouse, you wanna make sure that it has a clean out. That's really important too, that it has a side that will open up or it'll have a panel that you can remove in order to have access to the house to clean out any kind of, of nesting material. So you just wanna maintain it the best way that you can. So that is what we have prepared for you today. And it looks like we've got some people on. Um, Randy is on and says, good morning, everybody. And he says, house finches are back in the neighborhood. So Randy is seeing some house finches. And here is Bob who sent in those photos of the bluebirds that are starting to nest, which is very exciting. Um, he says the female bluebird has been very busy this morning. I'm guessing that nest is about double the size from the photo I sent in. All right, so she is busy. Um, he says definitely seeing song sparrows under the feeders. Yeah, so keep your eyes out under your feeders for the song sparrow. Here's another, there we go. So here's a picture of the song sparrow again. They have a really streaked breast with a little black dot on it, which is kind of hard to tell from, from this angle of the photo. And they also have what are called black mailer stripes. It almost looks like um, kind of like some facial hair here. So that's a dark patch on its face here. And they sing a lot. So uh, like their name suggests, they are very, very boisterous as far as their singing goes. So it looks like that is everybody's comments and questions for today. On Tuesday, we are actually having an in-person presentation here at the Birdhouse that we will stream at the, live stream at the same time. Uh, we have Dana Ford of Braddock Bay Raptor Research will be here giving a presentation on owls. So she'll be talking about the different owls that call our area home, including the sawwet owls and long-eared owls. And she also will be bringing an owl in. So she has a great horned owl of her own that uh, is no longer able to be out in the wild. And she will bring that in as well. So that is on Tuesday here at the birdhouse. And we will also be streaming it at the same time. So until then, have a great weekend. Thank you guys for tuning in.